with some traffic and some weather and some misery. Apart from cars and places to park them, I don't really spend that much money. I live a pretty modest lifestyle without other expensive hobbies or vices. But what that means is that most of the effort I've exerted in my professional career has been to afford the next dream car. And there was a moment after I purchased the Verde Ithaca LP640 manual car where I kind of had this conundrum of like, literally, how do I motivate myself to keep working because I had the car that I'd always dreamt about. And it was around that time that I honestly just couldn't take the grind and the hours and the misery at times of selling cars at Motor Cars of Georgia. And so that's when I chose to hang it up. And I kind of lived the next year or so of my life, not really sure what was going to come next. We started developing VinWiki and stuff like that. And really the next goal became have the same car without the big car payment that I had. And so through manipulating the markets, I ended up being able to buy the next one without a car payment. And so that was awesome. I had the dream car, but as we were really just pursuing different things and trying to grow VinWiki, there was a moment where I had to decide to want a more expensive car than what I had simply to keep myself motivated entrepreneurially. And so there was a time where I told several friends I want you to keep me accountable that I'll buy a Bugatti Veyron. I know it seems ridiculous to go out and want to buy a million dollar car with all the cool cars that I've already got, but I need that goal to keep me going. And so I told them that and they said, well, I'm sure you'll get it at some point. And so that has been kind of the driving force. But as you kind of start really looking at cars and what they needed and what it was really going to take to run a Veyron long term, it's a pretty daunting process because you really can't get around 10 to 20,000 a year for oil and 10 to $25,000 a year for tires, regardless of how many miles you put on the car. And that's a ton. And I couldn't really make sense of, of exactly how that was going to work without me somehow falling into a lot of money that I don't see coming right now. And so I was like, well, you know, maybe I should explore some alternatives. And Koenigsegg has always been a car that I was just enamored with. I love what the company stands for, just the spirit of, you know, we're going to build the fastest cars in the world kind of out of nothing. And the only cars that are kind of in the same ballpark in the U.S are the 12 US legal CCX cars. John Tamarian from Curated in Miami was here recently to tell some car stories and he said they had just brought one in on consignment. And there are not a lot of cars that I'll hear about and say, can I drive that? At this point, I've had the privilege to drive just about everything there is and there's not a whole lot of cars out there that I'm just dying to experience, but a Koenigsegg CCX is one of those cars. And so when he said that, while it may have been inappropriate or a little bit over the top, I said, John, can I come down there and drive the car? And he said, sure. You know, I mean, I really want to know if that is a better goal for me than a Veyron. But South Florida is about a 650, 700 mile drive from here in Atlanta, which is really a distance where I'm still going to prefer a road trip over going to the airport and flying down there and dealing with a car on that side and trying to maneuver around. Like I'd rather just get in my car and wind up there later that day. But you know, it still is a huge trip to take just to test drive some car for 15 or 20 minutes. And so it really became this kind of like, what would you do for a Klondike bar equation? What would you do for a Koenigsegg test drive? And, and it really, there were some other things that I wanted to be able to do in South Florida. There were some relatives there that I hadn't seen in a little while. And my son and my wife were kind of interested in going down there as well. So it kind of just became this idea of like a family road trip to see some family and maybe have a little detour to go out and test drive this $1.3 million car they're asking. And so we decided to drive south. And now if you do not have children or if you have not tried to transport them over a long distance by car, it is the worst thing ever. I would prefer most forms of medieval torture to having to road trip with my now five-year-old son. But alas, I, I get it. You know, it's one of those things that as a parent you have to do. And I now understand the stress and anxiety I could see my parents feel in the same circumstance when I was a young child. And so it is awful. It's the worst thing ever, but it's one of those things that you just kind of have to do. And in this case, it's what I had to do to justify in my head going all this way to test drive this expensive car. And so I was still very excited. I had no idea if I was even going to be to fit in a Koenigsegg. I'd seen a few up close. I had set in a CC8S actually at an event hosted by John Tamarian about 15 years ago. And we make the drive down and it's awful. And he's complaining about how long it's been and everything else. And it's just, you know, a 
drive that I could easily do in seven hours becomes 10, 10 and a half, 11 hours with some traffic and some weather and some misery. Of course, that first night, some congestion that he'd had that day turned into an ear infection. He's up all night just screaming and cannot sleep. It ends up with an emergency room visit, followed by an urgent care visit, followed by a prescription, followed by a miraculous healing, followed by whatever the stresses were the next day. So it's a standard time with your young child road trip. But the next day we do go down to curate it and I spend some time sending them off to do something else. And John and I take this car out. And you know, there's so much about the car that is just majestic to behold. I mean, what they did in the design with the aerodynamics, with the carbon fiber work, with the monocot, with everything that went into it is amazing, especially for a car like this that was so early in the company's production capability. And obviously Demuro's walked everybody through the quirks and features of the car. And there are many of them and it's that's part of the charm like this car is very very weird and it was their first attempt at their own proprietary engine which was still somewhat derived from what the Ford racing V8s that they had used in the CC8, 8S, and R. But it, you know, it was their own motor and it's all branded. I mean, it looks awesome. Everything about the way the car is put together is super, super cool, including of course, the amazing doors. And so we get it open and I get in the car and I actually do fit pretty well. I mean, I can sit up almost straight and apart from not really being able to maneuver my right knee around the steering wheel very easily, the car does work very, very well ergonomically. The seats are extremely comfortable. The frontward visibility is awesome. The rearward visibility is abysmal. Everything that you kind of expect out of it is generally true. The shifter location is perfect. All that stuff is great. So I was super excited about that. You know, the car sounds monstrous. It sounds very much like a big American V8 muscle car. And that kind of makes sense based on the engine derivation and the big blowers that are on it. And so it had that kind of like 70s big block feel to it. And honestly, as you start to drive it, that's the best way to describe it. It makes a ton of noise at any RPM, not necessarily correlating to how hard the motor's working. It's just really, really loud. And it's a very surreal experience to be in with this curved glass windshield and everything else that's funny. It's just, it is otherworldly to be in. And it's just kind of a lot to take in. You know, there are times when you think, all right, in my head, based on other cars I've driven, this is what I think this car is going to be like. And I talked about the first time I got to drive a Bugatti Veyron that it, it vastly exceeded the quality and the refinement and just the mass produced and industrial strength feel that that car had when I fully expected it to kind of drive like a kit car. I mean, it was a car that very few were made and it was an early car in that run. It was one of those things that I didn't really know what to expect, and honestly, it vastly exceeded my own expectations. So I was thrilled with that, and I was hopeful that that would kind of be the case. But quite honestly, throughout the entire process, the way that the Koenigsegg drove and behaved was exactly what I thought it would be. It drove like a race car on the street. It constantly felt so low and so stiff that any seam or anything in the road you thought you were going to scrape. It was so rigid that everything really got transmitted and it kind of moved over the road as one piece. It, it's hard to describe, but just think the absolute opposite of a Corvette there, you know, where you'll see the hood move before you move. I mean, this car is as stiff as anything I've ever been in and the behavior of the motor felt very much like it was put into the car, not that they were kind of engineered together. And it had honestly a very pre-production feel. It's like you'd expect like an SLC to drive. Like it's got a monstrously powerful motor in a very stiff chassis that's kind of built with one thing in mind. And, and, and that's going really, really fast. And it, it definitely felt powerful. It, there was torque available everywhere, but it still had this kind of incomplete or unrefined finish to it. And not the way that taking a Ferrari challenge car or a true LMP race car out on the road might feel. Just like there are steps to come. And I can imagine that the Agira line and everything that's come after this is a much more completed and well-engineered car. But again, this car drove sort of exactly like you would think it would, like a small batch hyper car. And you, we got to wind it out a little bit. I mean, nowhere where you could really get deep into the RPM range and anything beyond fourth gear, but the car was fast. It got up and went. I mean, at low speeds, I would say the performance is very similar to my LP640. I mean, it's, it's torquey, it's fast, it goes, it makes a good noise and all this stuff. The the way that the transmission, which was very notchy, I liked the feel of that, mated with the motor, mated with the clutch they'd set up, was a little bit weird. It was honestly a very easy car to kind of stall, and it was very hard to modulate the throttle between like 
an idle and a clutch slippage point. So regardless, the car was, was a lot of fun and it was such an experience to be in. There really wasn't anything like it. A lot of the things I like about my Mercy, you could easily like about this. The fact that it was really useless and unrefined and everything else. But at the price point and for the insanity of it all, I felt myself constantly wanting it to be just a little bit more done. I loved what the car was. I didn't exactly love how the car did things. And it's probably kind of why I like a Mercy so much more than a Diablo. There's a coolness factor to a Diablo that might even exceed a Mercy in some sense. But at the same time, like the Mercy Lego is just good enough to be the perfect car for me. And this was a car that was not quite good enough to make you want it. The reason you want the car is for what it stands for, that it's a manual Koenigsegg, that it's that rare, that cool, that special, that it has all these amazing features, not because you just crave time behind the wheel. After driving it for about 20 minutes with its weak air conditioning and, you know, general, like, I'm driving a car that's worth over a million dollars, you know, anxiety that goes with it, it was kind of like, I'm ready to park the thing and just stare at it for a little while longer. It immediately made sense why you never see them with much more than 100 miles a year put on them. It's just not a car that anyone, it seems, is just dying to go out and take on a massive road trip or put a ton of miles on or whatever. And, and, and that's okay. Like Cars can be art. They can be significant. They can be something that you just want to have in the lineup of your 15, 20, 50 car collection. And that seems to be where they've existed during their time in the U.S. in particular. And that's okay. It's not what I look for. However, if I had 50 cars, like no question at all, it would be one there. But I think, you know, having driven it and the Bugatti, it, it certainly didn't displace that as being the Halo car. It didn't, you know, I think I could own the car for less. And I definitely think based on the general demand for the Koenigsegg older cars right now and where Zondas and everything else have gone price-wise and how much the new cars are, I think you could make money owning this car, but I don't think if you had it amongst a stable of other awesome cars that you'd find yourself grabbing that shield-shaped key as often as you'd want to, given how cool the car really is. I think you'd have a lot of fun days just drinking a beer, staring at it in your garage, but I don't know that you would just constantly want to take it out. And that's what I want out of a car. And when you drive a Bugatti, you say, if I could stomach all the maintenance costs, like maybe it should be the only car I have. And so I still think for me, the Bugatti is the goal. And so I was honored at the chance to go down and spend some time with it. It certainly marks one of the most enjoyable and awesome automotive experiences I've had. And I thank John at Curated for the chance to spend time in the car. And I know it'll find an amazing home sometime soon. It certainly is the right one with the Top Gear spoiler and the Dimag carbon wheels and everything else. And so it was an awesome time. It was an awesome car. And it was worth the arduous road trip with a young child and everything that entailed. But uh, I would do it again tomorrow, but probably still not with my checkbook in hand. Hi, I'm Ed from Vinwicky, and for the past 15 years, I've trusted the experts at Butler Tire to put Michelin tires on all my cars. I love Michelin products because the performance is obviously unmatched. And every time you get in your car, you can predict that it's going to do exactly what you want it to do. And one thing I love about coming to Butler is that they've always got the full range in stock. And every time I drop my car here, I wait a few minutes and I'm on the road. So that's why I come to Butler for all my Michelin tires. I get the best result, the best customer service, and you should too.